My name is Sydney Goldstein, and on behalf of Stephen Barkley and me, it's a pleasure to invite to uh, welcome you here to this very special lunch. I'm sure a lot of you know that City Arts and Lectures is in the midst of celebrating its 15th anniversary season of presenting concerts. I said concerts, it's interesting. We did our first concert on Saturday night with Gladys Knight and Terry Gross, but of primarily presenting lectures and onstage conversations with leading figures in literature, criticism, and the performing arts. And the, in the past week and a half, we have done, Steve and I seem to have managed to present just about every kind of event we know how to do. And today we're doing what we know how to do best, which is put ourselves in the hands of our friends at the Hay Street Grill. Patricia Unterman, Doris Flaherty, John Bissell, and all of the people here at the Hay Street Grill. Tony Moore in the kitchen, who seems to have been cooking for us nonstop for the last 72 hours. They take such good care of us, and they're a very important part of the work that we do. I'm sure that all of you know that the Hay Street Grill has become the sort of Algonquin of San Francisco, except that the food is a lot better. <laughs> And I don't know how many of you know that there was a dinner here the other night for Salman Rushdie with every major artist in the Bay Area. And it happened here in part not just because the food is good and because the service is great, but Patricia Unterman, whose restaurant this is, is one of the most well-read people I've ever met. I don't know how many people not only read all of the satanic, satanic verses of Salman Rushdie, but also had read his new novel two weeks ago. So we're especially glad to be here to be celebrating our 15th anniversary with our very first guest who appeared at the Herbst Theater 15 years ago, Fran Lebowitz. And, and it's especially good that we've been able to turn the Hay Street Grill into a private setting because it's the only way that Fran would be able to be comfortable and be able to smoke. <laughs> Fran Leibowitz is the author of two best-selling collections of essays, Metropolitan Life and Social Studies. She's been referred to as a modern-day Dorothy Parker, but to my mind, she's a lot better writer. After dropping out of high school in New Jersey, and you should know that Fran's parents are here right now, Ruth and Harold, and last night Ruth said, if Fran would go back to school, they would pay for it. <laughs> Fran moved from New Jersey to New York and quickly established herself, I don't think they were kidding, uh, quickly established herself as a most independent and gifted wit. Among other less literary jobs, she wrote a column called I Cover the Waterfront for Andy Warhol's interview magazine. Most recently, as a serious advocate of reading and education, she wrote a children's book titled Mr. Chaz and Lisa Sue Meet the Panda, and the book is illustrated by Michael Graves, and I think there are copies of it in the next room. After overcoming 10 years of writer's block, Fran is finishing her first novel, Exterior Signs of Wealth. And while, while she is widely appreciated as one of America's most original and tireless wits, sometimes overlooked is the fact that she is a uniquely artful writer, and she works hard at it. Another fact that might not be completely evident is that Fran Lebowitz is a most generous and loyal friend, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce her to you once again. Please welcome Fran Lebowitz. Thank you. These are my backup readers. <laughs> it's a tip I picked up from Gladys Knight. Uh, uh, for those of you who are uh, here uh, for Simon Rushdie, um, I hope you won't be disappointed. This won't be quite as suspenseful. <laughs> I hope. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, maybe read one or two things from um, uh, this book. Uh, both my books were put into one book. Um, disappointing to me that that was possible. <laughs> and um, then I'm going to answer questions from the audience in an entertaining fashion. <laughs> you don't have to ask them 
in an entertaining fashion. <laughs> in fact, I would actually prefer that you don't <laughs> make that attempt. Um, I think the, the um, piece I'm going to read is um, called, oh, I can't remember. Well, it's called Diary of a New York Apartment Hunter. Um, it was written, you know, quite a long time ago. Um, I mean, both of these books were written um, when I was actually in my 20s, uh, and I'm now not in my 20s. <laughs> um, so that uh, you can see that it was bad even then. Uh, when I read this out of town, although probably not in San Francisco, people think it's science fiction. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Diary of a New York Apartment Hunter. Friday. Awakened to the crack of dawn by a messenger bearing this coming Sunday's New York Times real estate section. First six apartments gone already. Spent a good 15 minutes dividing the number of New York Times editors into the probable number of people looking for two-bedroom apartments. Spent additional half hour wondering how anyone who has a paper to get out every day could possibly have time to keep up 1,100 friendships. <laughs> Realized this theory not plausible and decided instead that the typesetters all live in co-ops with wood-burning fireplaces. <laughs> Wondered briefly why listings always specify wood-burning fireplaces decided that considering the prices they're asking, it's probably just a warning device for those who might otherwise figure what the hell and just burn money. <laughs> Called VF and inquired politely as to whether anyone in his extremely desirable building had died during the night. <laughs> Reply in the negative. I just don't get it. It's quite a large building and no one in it has died for months. In my tiny little building, they're dropping like flies. <laughs> Made a note to investigate the possibility that high ceilings and decorative moldings prolong life. <laughs> Momentarily chilled by the thought that someone who lives in a worse building than mine is waiting for me to die. <laughs> Cheered immeasurably by realization that A, nobody lives in a worse building than mine, <laughs> And B, particularly those who are waiting for me to die. <laughs> Saturday, uptown to look a co-op in venerable midtown building. Met real estate broker in lobby. A Caucasian version of Tokyo Rose. <laughs> she immediately launched into a description of all the respectably employed people who were waiting a line for this apartment. Showed me living room first. Large, airy, terrific view of well-known discount drugstore. <laughs> Two bedrooms, sure enough. Kitchen, sort of. When I asked why the present occupant had seen fit to cut three five-foot-high arches out of the inside wall of the master bedroom, she muttered something about cross-ventilation. When I pointed out that there were no windows on the opposite wall, she ostentatiously extracted a sheaf of papers from her briefcase and studied them closely. Presumably, these contained the names of all the Supreme Court justices who were waiting for this apartment. <laughs> Nevertheless, I pressed on and asked her what one might do with three five-foot-high arches in one's bedroom wall. She suggested stained glass. I suggested pews in the living room and services on Sunday. She showed me a room she referred to as the master bath. I asked her where the slaves bathed. She rustled her papers ominously and showed me the living room again. I looked disgruntled. She brightened and showed me something called a fun bathroom. It had been covered in fabric from floor to ceiling by someone who obviously was not afraid to mix patterns. I informed her unceremoniously that I never again wanted to be shown a fun bathroom. I don't want to have fun in the bathroom. I just want to bathe my slaves. She showed me the living room again. Either she just couldn't get enough of that discount drugstore, or she was trying to trick me into thinking there were three living rooms. <laughs> Impudently, I asked her where one ate, seeing as I had not been shown a dining room, and the kitchen was approximately the size of a brandy snifter. <laughs> well, she said, some people use a second bedroom as a dining room. I replied that I needed the second bedroom to write in. This was a mistake, because it reminded her of all the ambassadors to the UN on her list of prospective tenants. <laughs> Well, she said, the master bedroom is rather large. Listen, I said, I already eat on my bed. In a one-room, rent-controlled slum apartment, I'll eat on the bed. In an ornately priced, high-maintenance co-op, I want to eat at a table. 
Call me silly, call me foolish, but that's the kind of girl I am. <laughs> she escorted me out of the apartment and left me standing in the lobby as she, as she hurried off, anxious, no doubt, to call Cardinal O'Connor and tell him, okay, the apartment was his. <laughs> Sunday. Spent the entire day recovering from a telephone call with a real estate broker who, in response to my having expressed displeasure at having been shown an apartment in which the closest thing to a closet had been the living room, <laughs> said, well, Fran, what do you expect for $3,400 a month? <laughs> he hung up before I could tell him that actually, to tell you the truth, for $3,400 a month, I expected the Winter Palace. <laughs> Furnished. Not to mention fully staffed. Monday. Look this morning at the top floor of the building, which I have privately christened Uncle Tom's Brownstone. <laughs> One end of the floor slopes sufficiently for me to be able to straighten up and ask why the refrigerator was in the living room. I was promptly put in my place by the owner, who looked me straight in the eye and said, because it doesn't fit in the kitchen. <laughs> True, I conceded taking a closer look, that is a problem. I'll tell you what though, and this may not have occurred to you, but that kitchen does fit in the refrigerator. <laughs> Why don't you try it? I left before he could act on my suggestion and repaired to a phone booth. Mortality rate in VF's building, still amazingly low. <laughs> Called about apartment list in today's paper was told fixture fee, $100,000. Replied that unless Rembrandt had doodled on the walls, $100,000 wasn't a fixture fee, it was war reparations. <laughs> Tuesday, let desperation get the best of me and went to see an apartment described as interesting. <laughs> interesting generally means that it has a skylight, no elevator, and they'll throw in the glassine envelopes for free. This one was even more interesting than usual because the broker informed me Jack Kerouac had once lived here. Someone's pulling your leg, I told him. Jack Kerouac's still living here. <laughs> <clears throat> Wednesday, ran into a casual acquaintance on 7th Avenue. Turns out he too is looking for a two bedroom apartment. We compared notes. Did you see the one with the refrigerator in the living room, he asked. <laughs> yes, indeed, I said. Well, he said, today I looked at a dentist's office in the East 50s. A dentist office, I said. Was the chair still there? <laughs> no, he replied, but there was a sink in every room. <laughs> it sounded like a deal for someone. <laughs> Called real estate broker and inquired as to price of newly advertised co-op. Amount in substantial six figures. What about financing, I asked. Financing? She shuddered audibly. This is an all-cash building. I told her that to me, an all-cash building is what you put on Boardwalk or Park Place. <laughs> she suggested that I look further uptown. I replied that if I looked any further uptown, I'd have to take karate lessons. She thought that sounded like a good idea. <laughs> Thursday, was shown co-op apartment of recently deceased actor. By now so seasoned that I didn't bat an eye at the sink in the master bedroom. Assumed that either he was a dentist on the side <laughs> or that it didn't fit in the bathroom. <laughs> Second assumption proved correct. <laughs> Couldn't understand why, though. You'd think that there not being a shower in there would have left plenty of room for a sink. <laughs> Real estate broker pointed out recent improvements. Tangerine colored kitchen appliances, bronze mirrored fireplace, a fun living room. <laughs> told the broker that what with the asking price, the maintenance, and the cost of unimproving, I couldn't afford to live there and still wear shoes on a regular basis. <laughs> Called VF again. First the good news. A woman in his building died. Then the bad news. She decided not to move. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'm, I'm going to risk this. Um, I'm going to read this short piece. Uh, for me, that uh, last piece was a very long piece. Um, this is called Pointers for Pets. Um, this was written before, you know, the recent um, tremendous um, vivid compassion for animals. Uh, 
But um, now, of course, probably this will be like a Salmon Rushdie reading. <laughs> <laughs> Pointers for pets. I feel compelled by duty to begin this discourse with what I actually think of as a statement, but what will more probably be construed as an admission. I do not like animals of any sort. I don't even like the idea of animals. Animals are no friends of mine. They are not welcome in my house. They occupy no space in my heart. Animals are off my list. I will say, however, in the spirit of qualification, that I mean them no particular harm. I won't bother animals if animals won't bother me. Well, perhaps I had better amend that last sentence. I won't personally bother animals. I do feel, though, that a plate bereft of a good cut of something rare is an affront to the serious diner, and that while I have frequently run across the fellow who could indeed be described as a broccoli and potatoes man, I cannot say that I have ever really taken to such a person. Therefore, I might more accurately state that I do not like animals with two exceptions, the first being in the past tense, at which point I like them just fine in the form of nice crispy sparabs and basswegian penny loafers. And the second being outside, by which I mean not merely outside as an outside the house, but genuinely outside, as an outside in the woods, or preferably outside in the South American jungle. This is, after all, only fair. I don't go there, why should they come here? <laughs> the above being the case, it should then come as no surprise that I do not approve of the practice of keeping animals as pets. Not approve is too mild. Pets should be disallowed by law, especially dogs, especially in New York City. I have not infrequently verbalized this sentiment. It will now passes for polite society and have invariably been the recipient of the information that even if dogs should be withheld from the frivolous, there would still be the blind and the pathologically lonely to think of. I am not totally devoid of compassion, and after much thought, I believe that I have hit upon the perfect solution to this problem. Let the lonely lead the blind. <laughs> Implementation of this plan would provide companionship to one and a sense of direction to the other without inflicting upon the rest of the populace the all too common spectacle of grown men addressing German shepherds in the respectful tones best reserved for elderly clergymen and internal revenue agents. <laughs> you animal lovers uninterested in helping news dealers across busy intersections will just have to see companionship elsewhere. If actual friends are not within your grasp, May I suggest that you take a cue from your favorite celebrity and consider investing in a really good entourage. <laughs> the advantages of such a scheme are inestimable. An entourage is indisputably superior to a dog or even, of course, to actual friends and will begin to pay for itself almost immediately. You do not have to walk an entourage. On the contrary, one of the major functions of an entourage is that it walks you. You do not have to name an entourage. You do not have to play with an entourage. You do not have to take an entourage to the vet, although the conscientious entourage owner makes certain that his entourage has had all of its shots. <laughs> you do, of course, have to feed an entourage, but this can be accomplished in decent Italian restaurants and without the bother and mess of large tin cans and special plastic dishes. If the entourage suggestion does not appeal to you, perhaps you should alter your concept of companionship. Living things need not enter into it at all. George and Silver and Duncan Fife sofas make wonderful companions, <laughs> as do all alcoholic beverages and out-of-season fruits. <laughs> Use your imagination. Study up on the subject. You'll think of something. If, however, you do not think of something, and animal lovers being a singularly intractable lot, chances are that you won't, I have decided to direct the remainder of my remarks to the actual pets themselves, in the hope that they might at least learn to disport themselves with dignity and grace. If you are a dog and your owner suggests that you wear a sweater, suggest that he wear a tail. <laughs> if you have been named after a human being of artistic note, run away from home. It is unthinkable that even an animal should be obliged to share quarters with anyone who calls a cat Ford Maddox Ford. Dogs who earn their living by appearing in television commercials in which they constantly and aggressively demand meat should remember that, in at least one Far Eastern country, they are meat. <laughs> <laughs> if
If you are only a bird in a gilded cage, count your blessings. If you are an owl being kept as a pet, I applaud and encourage your tendency to hoot. You are to be highly commended for expressing such a sentiment. An owl is, of course, not a pet at all. It is an unforgivable and wistful effort in the direction of whimsy. <laughs> no animal should ever jump up on the dining room furniture unless absolutely certain that he can hold his own in the conversation. <laughs> Thank you. I will now be happy to answer your questions. All you have to do, raise your hand. Yes. Can you tell us about your tenure writer's block and what finally got you out of that? The question was, one of my favorites, uh, is can I tell you about my tenure writer's block and what got me out of it? Well, you can imagine how uneventful a tenure writer's block is. <laughs> there isn't really that much to tell. Um, just imagine yourself sulking for a decade. <laughs> um, I don't know, really know what got me out of it. Um, I think that probably at a certain point, uh, just around that 10 year mark, um, which, you know, to me now, a decade just seems like that. Um, I just missed my 30s, that was it. Um, I think what probably got me out of it was, uh, I think that the, the fear of not writing, writing became greater than the fear of writing. Um, so it was a kind of, um, I believe all of life is controlled by this kind of war of fears, whichever fear wins out. Most writers are afraid, um, unfortunately, in my opinion, um, not to write. Uh, <laughs> but, um, so that's, I think that's what happened. Well, I guess that about wraps it up. <laughs> You're not going to forgive me for the animal thing? <laughs> yes? Well, you know, your parents seem like perfectly decent, happy. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to you? Um, the question, although, of course, I would actually think of it more as a statement, um, was that your parents seem like perfectly decent people. What happened to you? Um, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure. My parents are perfectly decent people. Um, you probably should ask, they're probably, do they plant you in the audience? Or? Um, I think, you know, as um, Sydney alluded to before, um, their, their primary complaint about me is that I um, didn't go to college. Um, this is uh, despite the fact that I am um, actually old enough to be um, a retired uh, dean at this point. Um, they still haven't actually forgiven me for this. Um, and so they, they live in hope that I will uh, proceed with my education. Uh, no, they haven't forgiven me for that. That's their major complaint. Like right now, I was to go to college, everything would be fine. Um, well, in fact, uh, my mother once called me as I was leaving for the airport and I said, I can't speak to you right now. I, I have to catch a plane. She said, where are you going? And I said, um, up to Harvard. And she said, you are? <laughs> and, and I said, I'm, I'm going to give a speech not to matriculate. And she said, you know, I think you could get in now. Um, I don't, by the way, think I could get in now. Um, I really um, dislike school uh, very intensely. Um, I like school up until uh, about seventh grade. Uh, I like school, I like grammar school. And um, that is because uh, I think we only like the things that we excel at. And I was a spectacular grammar school student. And um, that is because I went to a grammar school where the uh, primary requirement was drawing pilgrims. <laughs> and I was, if not the best pilgrim drawer, one of the top three or four in the country, in the 50s, when there was, it was very competitive. And because I didn't just draw pilgrims in school, I drew them in my free time, too. Because I think I imagined, since it was so stressed in my school, um, I imagined it being a really supreme importance. And so I would practice my pilgrim drawing all the time. In fact, I was quite innovative in my pilgrim drawing um, because I think I imagined that at some point in my life I would be in a circumstance where there would be a kind of crisis and someone would shout, can anyone here draw a pilgrim? <laughs> and I would race to the fore and uh, save the day with my masterful pilgrim drawing. Um, then of course I got past that time in school and um, algebra replaced pilgrim drawing. <laughs> so really, my poor performance in school was also like my writer's block. It was sulking. I was in a fury. 
you know, one day pilgrims, the next day algebra. Um, so I did extremely, very, very poorly, um, very poorly in um, school once algebra started. Um, and I disliked it. I disliked high school tremendously. Um, now in this, I really don't think even you, a critic of my life, um, could, could say that you enjoyed high school. I, in, I really believe that everyone hates high school. There's maybe two people in every high school who are having fun. One is the captain of the football team, the other one's his girlfriend. <laughs> so, so the majority, the vast majority of people don't enjoy high school. Um, and I, um, I was, before I actually got expelled from school, Sydney was kind enough to say that I dropped out, which is kind of voluntary. Um, I didn't drop out, I was expelled. Um, but before I got expelled, um, it was preceded by a number of suspensions. Um, one of which uh, occurred because I was caught uh, sneaking out of a pep rally. Um, <laughs> Uh, because in my high school, pep was mandatory. <laughs> and um, although I really dislike all sports, I, I dislike football the most. Now, obviously, I'm speaking from the point of view of a spectator. Um, football is the worst sport to watch. Certainly, it's played outside in cold weather. Um, and it is not um, understandable. You can't understand at all football. Um, and it's been explained to me a number of times. Uh, I can understand, I also can understand why people think football players are stupid because I think, well, they understand football. <laughs> uh, football t to me is, um, I would say these twin things, football to me is algebra in motion. <laughs> and so I didn't make it, you know. Um, and so I have really uh, decided not to go to college when I got expelled from uh, high school. Um, it was a very important day because I also decided not to go to med medical school that same day. <laughs> Which is the real thing my parents haven't forgiven me for. Um, so I am uh, not a doctor, um, which was uh, their secret plan for me. I don't know what you asked, but that's the answer. <laughs> yes? Why did you write a children's book? Why did I write a children's book? Um, I wrote a children's book um, mainly because I always wanted to write a children's book. Um, and I specifically mentioned to my editor after my first book, Metropolitan Life, came out, and uh, he said, everyone who has a first book that's a success wants to write a children's book. And that's because they're scared to write their real book. <laughs> and although this was true, I was scared to write my real book. Um, I actually think of children's books as real books. Um, and I also never stopped reading them. I just kept reading them right along. You know, I wrote a children's book when I was little. Then I started reading adult books. And I just kept also reading children's books. Um, and so I just wanted to write one. And unlike every other thing that I was wanted to do, much to my surprise, I actually just did it. So that's how I did it. Um, and it was unlike any other uh, experience I had with writing since it was actually enjoyable. Um, the, the part that I found to be the least enjoyable was that um, because uh, I can only draw pilgrims, uh, and the book was not heavy on pilgrims, I had to have um, a collaborator, an illustrator. And um, you probably will be surprised to hear that I don't, really don't work that well with others. <laughs> And so um, I found it um, somewhat um, disconcerting to uh, have to, even though Michael Graves, who did the illustrations, is a close friend of mine, the idea of having to wait for someone else when I'm supposed to be the latest one um, was a little difficult. But I really enjoyed writing that book. Yes? What drives your humor? What drives my humor? Um, well, I would say that I actually believe um, humor to be, uh, someone's humor is to be a choice. Um, some people who have the, what you might call this drive um, are terrorists. <laughs> and some are funny. It's, a, it's the same impulse. All right? like, it's like either you can say something or you can get a machine gun. Um, so I would say that would be the drive. I would say, um, you, know, it, it's a, you know, it's, it's graduated. It can run anywhere from annoyance to fury. Um, which is why when people always say, no, can't you say something nice? Apparently not. <laughs> yes? Do you have any desire to go into film? Uh, the question was, do I have any desire to go into film? And the answer is emphatically no. Um, I have, uh, have zero, less than zero. Um, I didn't get that far in math, but I know there is a less than zero. <laughs> No, and the reason um, is not that I like movies. I love movies. I love to go to the movies. Um, but I, it is so not a writer's medium. Um, I mean, if I didn't like waiting for Michael Graves to draw, you can imagine how much I'd like to hear the opinion of an actor. Uh, <laughs> um, so that, um, 
you know, the, I, I've, I have always, um, since my first book came out, received many offers to write movies, um, unless they would let the writers be in control of the movies, which will um, never occur. Um, I will have no interest whatsoever. Um, and in fact, the cover of, of uh, this book, um, which has a picture of me sleeping in a screening room, um, Toni Morrison thought that the reason I, I have this picture was to show that I'm rejecting images. Um, instead of that I am slothful and falling asleep. Um, but I do, I love movies, but I would never want to write one. I would never really want to be an employee. Um, they pay quite a bit for writing movies, and um, what they pay you for is not the writing. It's listening to them. So, um, no, I have no interest in doing it. Yes? If I was to be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Well, you mean aside from the pilgrims? <laughs> I mean, there aren't that many pilgrim drawings extant, but, um, well, I, I hope that, um, I would like to be remembered for finally finishing my book. <laughs> um, I don't know. We'll see if that happens. It's kind of a race against the cigarettes. <laughs> yes? When did you first start writing and when did you first get published? Um, well, I, I think I really first started writing when I was a child, as soon as I could read. Um, in fact, before I had um, uh, writing as a job, before anyone was going to pay me to write, I wrote all the time. I wrote constantly. I did not start having trouble writing until I got my first uh, professional assignment. So I realized that, in fact, it isn't... Only recently, one of the things that helped me get over my writer's block was the realization that it isn't writing I hate, it's working. <laughs> I just hate to work. So I hate any job. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, so, so I started writing really when I was a child, and um, I was first published when I was about... Um, uh, 19, uh, I think, or 20, um, in a, what used to be called an underground magazine, um, a little tiny magazine, where uh, the job I initially had there was selling advertising. But um, since I couldn't actually bring myself to call anyone to ask them to put an ad in, um, I convinced the uh, owner of this publication that I would be better at anything else. And so that's when I started publishing. Yes? There was in the New York Times a couple months ago an article about the rich in the New York Times magazine, and there was a uh, one of the articles was a Fran Lebowitz talking the question to answer. Was that new? They didn't get any, any... Um, the question was, there was a uh, New York Times magazine section had a whole, um, uh, the whole magazine devoted to uh, the rich. Because, you know, they don't get enough, right? <laughs> and um, there was a, an interview with me in it. She wondered if it, it was me. It was me. Um, it had no humor. It was well done. And I thought <laughs> Well, the um, complaint was that it wasn't funny, um, and um, but but well done, not funny but well done, and she was she couldn't believe it was me because it was so unfunny. Um, well, I guess you're not that rich. <laughs> it was funny to them. Yes. Who is your editor, and what kind of a relationship do you have? Who is my editor, and what kind of relationship do you have? Well, actually, my my editor's recently died. Um, he was a man named Joe Fox, uh, and he was at Random House for like 35 years. Um, and now my editor is uh, Sunny Mehta at Knopf. And basically, I feel that the editor-writer um, relationship um, really consists of being taken out to very expensive dinners. Um, I don't allow uh, anyone to edit my work. Um, I find the whole notion of editing bizarre. There's no other kind of work where people do that. I mean, no one goes up to a painter and says, uh-uh, blue. I mean, um, so I have never uh, allowed line editing. Um, my feeling is, um, you're a better writer than me? Right. You know, so that um, I feel that it's basically a, um, a restaurant uh, situation. Uh, and so um, it doesn't really matter to me who, who my editor is from a point of view of, of, of line editing. Joe Fox uh, was pro probably the most uh, highly regarded line editor in this country. Um, but um, I didn't take advantage of that at all. Um, and when I send my manuscripts in, which is, you know, every decade or so, um, I write stet on the top, and it goes in. So um, that's my relationship. Hostile. Yes? Uh, are you friendly with any other contemporary writers? And if so, do they have any influence in your work? Well, the question was, am I, am I friendly with any other contemporary writers? And if so, do they have any influence on my work? I have very few friends who are writers. This is deliberate. Um, they really don't make the best companions. 
in my opinion. Um, you, you'd be surprised how, let us say, um, ungenerous writers are to one another, um, and how they may not actually be rooting for you. Um, <laughs> so I have a few friends who are writers, um, but, but not, they're, they're, they're the minority of my friends, and um, none of them influence me from the point of view of, of what I write. Um, Toni Morrison is a close friend of mine, and she influences very much to try to get me to write. Um, and so that, although I think that Tony's actually been quite a poor influence on me, um, because she did uh, kind of suck me into a year of watching the Menendez trial. <laughs> and I watched the entire trial on the telephone with her, um, which started in, 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 I was living in Princeton that year, and started around one in the afternoon, and I felt okay about it, because she was doing it too. So I thought, well, Tony's doing it, it's all right for me to do it. That was, I didn't realize she got up at five o'clock in the morning. And by the time she, we, she called to watch the trial, she was done. <laughs> this was the secret to her success. <laughs> um, so that, um, but I actually find Tony to be an extremely inspiring uh, relationship in my life. Um, but not from the point of view of actually what I write, but just as a kind of a model of a person who can write and watch the Menendez trial <laughs> at the same time. That's my aspiration. Yes? What authors do you like to read? What authors do I like to read? Well, I am an extremely, um, I'm really a bookworm. I mean, if I, I really read all the time instead of, um, say, writing. Um, and um, I read almost only fiction. I have uh, very little interest in actual facts. Um, and I'm, I'm such a promiscuous reader. Um, I am the uh, slut of literature. So I'm such a promiscuous reader that I, I really couldn't say exactly what writers I like. And um, I, I like many, many writers. Um, to read, not to eat with. <laughs> yes? Uh, I think it was a year or two ago you wrote an essay in Mirabella, is that right? No, it was an interview. And it was, uh, it seemed somewhat serious. See, this is another complaint. <laughs> Have you met her? But uh, you said something, you said quite a bit in that article about politics, and I'm wondering if you would make further comment on the Clinton or the state of the nation. Um, this um, question uh, was it that she had read an interview that I did in Mirabelle magazine that was quite serious, um, said somewhat dis disapprovingly. Um, and um, it was a lot about politics, and could I comment further on that? The, the, the interview was actually entitled, If I Were Dictator, uh, which is pretty much uh, the main comment I could make about my political uh, stance. Um, and so there were a lot of questions of what I would do if I was the dictator of the United States. The reason it was dictator instead of president was um, understandable, right? I mean, it, <laughs> it's very hard to rule in a democracy. And as you can see, nothing can get done. So I am available, by the way, uh, for this position. Um, it is my second choice, my first being pope. <laughs> um, pope is preferable to dictator. Um, they last longer. Uh, but I'm available for the papacy. Um, in case anyone here has any poll, I don't, I don't know you. And this has always been my first career choice. Um, I think without question the Pope has the best job in the world. I mean, he never has to look for an apartment. <laughs> he has great clothes. And people kneel when he comes into the room. So I hope I answered your question. Yes? Um, could you please talk about your sister? Your relationship with her. Could I please talk about my sister and my relationship with her? I have a younger sister. Um, her name is Ellen. Uh, our relationship is one of sisters. Uh, <laughs> she is my younger sister, but unfortunately, my taller sister. And um, she's been taller than me. She, she's almost four years younger than me. She's been taller than me almost my entire life. When she was born, she was taller than me. <laughs> so I have yet to forgive her for this. Um, other than that, she just, she's a sister. Um, tall, tall, younger sister. <laughs> like, all right, now I could deal with it. You know, if your sister was born taller than you when you were in your 40s, it would be all right. <laughs> but as a child, because then you, you need that height advantage, you need the advantage, the physical advantage. I was deprived of this. Uh, this is my parents' fault. <laughs> this was a, a kind of preemptive uh, attack by my parents uh, in case I ever got kicked out of high school. Yes? Uh, Warhol, what was it like? The question was, you worked with Warhol, what was it like? Well, first of all, I didn't work with him, I worked for him. 
Um, this locution, people working with each other, is something I really disapprove of. <laughs> Um, people don't really work with each other, do they? Someone works for someone else. But we don't say that anymore, do we? We live in this kind of haze of misspoken language now. So people say things like, this is my cleaning lady, she works with me. <laughs> I'm the chairman of the board of General Motors. We work together. <laughs> I worked for Andy. I didn't work with him. Um, I would actually rather have worked for Andy than with him, to tell you the truth, because that way I'm not responsible for his work. Um, and it was, um, and I started working there when I was uh, about 20. Um, and, uh, you know, it was an unusual environment for a writer, um, since very few people in that environment were that, oh, I was going to say literary, but I could even say literate. <laughs> uh, um, but it was, a, I couldn't have gotten a job but a real magazine. Um, for that, you would actually have to have finished high school, gone to college, and, um, but that, they didn't have any kind of um, standards there. Um, well, they had standards, but not professional standards. Um, and so I qualified for the unprofessional standards, and um, it was unusual. It's not really the sort of question you can answer in one uh, sentence or paragraph. Um, but it wasn't Time, Inc., I could tell you that. <laughs> yes? Uh, in your invitation to the Graduate School of uh, Design at Harvard, uh, was that because you have any special interest or expertise in, uh, in architecture, architectural history? I, mean, I, I spoke at the, um, the question is, I spoke at the um, Graduate School of Design at Harvard, which is the architecture school, and he's wondering what actually my mother gave voice to when I told her I was going to Harvard to speak at the architecture school, which was, why would they ask you? <laughs> um, um, do I have any special expertise? Well, I think so. <laughs> um, I have a, a, a special interest in architecture and um, perfect taste. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, Fran will move to the next room to sign books if you like. You can see why we keep inviting her back again. She's not only the first person who ever spoke for us at the Herbst Theater, I think she is our most frequent guest. So thank you all for being here. My name is Sydney Goldstein, and on behalf of Stephen Barkley and me, it's a pleasure to invite to uh, welcome you here to this very special lunch. I'm sure a lot of you know that City Arts and Lectures is in the midst of celebrating its 15th anniversary season of presenting concerts. I said concerts, it's interesting. We did our first concert on Saturday night with Gladys Knight and Terry Gross, but of primarily presenting lectures and onstage conversations with leading figures in literature, criticism, and the performing arts. And the, in the past week and a half, we have done, Steve and I seem to have managed to present just about every kind of event we know how to do. And today we're doing what we know how to do best, which is put ourselves in the hands of our friends at the Hay Street Grill. Patricia Unterman, Doris Flaherty, John Bissell, and all of the people here at the Hay Street Grill, Tony Moore. Thank you. These are my backup readers. <laughs> it's a tip I picked up from Gladys Knight. Um, uh, for those of you who are uh, here uh, for Simon Rushdie, um, I hope you won't be disappointed. This won't be quite as suspenseful. <laughs> I hope. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, maybe read one or two things from um, uh, this book. Uh, both my books were put into one book. Um, disappointing to me that that was possible. <laughs> And um, then I'm going to answer questions from the audience in an entertaining fashion. <laughs> you don't have to ask them in an entertaining fashion. Um, 
And it's especially good that we've been able to turn the Hay Street Grill into a private setting because it's the only way that Fran would be able to be comfortable and be able to smoke. <laughs> Fran Leibowitz is the author of two best-selling collections of essays, Metropolitan Life and Social Studies. She's been referred to as a modern-day Dorothy Parker, but to my mind, she's a lot better writer. After dropping out of high school in New Jersey, and you should know that Fran's parents are here right now, Ruth and Harold, and last night Ruth said, if Fran would go back to school, they would pay for it. <laughs> Fran moved from New Jersey to New York and quickly established herself, I don't think they were kidding, uh, quickly established herself as a most independent and gore in the kitchen who seems to have been cooking for us nonstop for the last 72 hours. They take such good care of us and they're a very important part of the work that we do. I'm sure that all of you know that the Hay Street Grill has become the sort of Algonquin of San Francisco, except that the food is a lot better. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you know that there was a dinner here the other night for Salman Rushdie with every major artist in the Bay Area. And it happened here in part not just because the food is good and because the service is great, but Patricia Unterman, whose restaurant this is, is one of the most well-read people I've ever met. I don't know how many people not only read all of the satanic, satanic verses of Salman Rushdie, but also had read his new novel two weeks ago. So we're especially glad to be here to be celebrating our 15th anniversary with our very first guest, who appeared at the Herbst Theater 15 years ago, Fran Lebowitz, Gifted Wit. Among other less literary jobs, she wrote a column called I Cover the Waterfront for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine. Most recently, as a serious advocate of reading and education, she wrote a children's book titled Mr. Chaz and Lisa Sue Meet the Panda, and the book is illustrated by Michael Graves, and I think there are copies of it in the next room. After overcoming 10 years of writer's block, Fran is finishing her first novel, Exterior Signs of Wealth. And while, while she is widely appreciated as one of America's most original and tireless wits, sometimes overlooked is the fact that she is a uniquely artful writer, and she works hard at it. Another fact that might not be completely evident is that Fran Leibowitz is a most generous and loyal friend. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce her to you once again. Please welcome Fran Leibowitz.